Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for choosing the Integument Airlines. Captain has illuminated the fasten seatbelt sign, so please sit back, relax, and enjoy your tour of the Integument Dairy System. Alright, alright, all seriousness, right? No kidding. Here we go. Integument Dairy System, chapter 6 in your book, page 112. It's like 10 pages, there's 4 pictures, and this is fast. We're moving on to bigger and better things, skeletal and muscular system, skeletal system, 206 bones of your body that we'll be talking about. That's a lot of stuff. So, I'm going to go through these notes fairly quickly, get out a highlighter, pen or pencil, get ready to write, get ready to highlight, and we're moving on. If you don't have that stuff, with your notes printed off, pause the video, go get them, come back fast. Here we go. Alright, skin. It is an organ, although it doesn't seem like it because it's not in one's place, it's everywhere. It's the largest, heaviest organ in the body. It's covered in hair except, big except, except for the palms of your hands and soles of your feet. That's the only places that you should not have hair. It's important for maintaining homeostasis, internal environment. It's a protective barrier, no kidding. Cutaneous membrane. Cutaneous refers to the adjective basically means from the skin or of the skin. So there's no doubt what this is talking about. Homeostasis. Body temperature. We'll talk about sweat glands. Healing wounds. We'll see how that works for both shallow and deep wounds. And also aids in the production of vitamin D. Something that you can get in your diet, but also can get from UV rays of the sun. I don't care that you know all the names of these things and what's changing into what. All I care about is that you know what's happening here. The UV rays of the sun provide energy for molecules to change into vitamin D, which will get sent off in the bloodstream, digestive system, get where it needs to be. That's it. For body temperature, there is... Um, a couple, there's, there's a couple different things that you need to focus on here, and they are, uh, one, that blood vessels dilate, which means more blood is getting through, so more heat is coming through and eventually getting to the surface and being released, but there are also sweat glands that become active, releasing the warm water that's in our bodies, which if the warm water leaves, then the body cools off. There is also some other stuff in sweat, but... Nothing we'll talk about this time. We'll talk about that in future units. Another opposite effect or the opposite of regulation of body temperature is to increase temperature. So one thing that can happen is muscles contract in the dermal wall. We're talking about little muscles. And this is decreasing blood flow. So the less blood flow, the less heat loss. Opposite of what we just talked about in reducing body temperature. Sweat glands inactivate, and also skeletal muscles contract, although these are not part of the skin. The skin is insulating the heat that is being released from these skeletal muscles contracting. And you've probably experienced this before when you've shivered. Your body is shaking. Even your jaw is shaking. Muscles just shaking uncontrollably. Next up, healing of wounds. Inflammation is basically four things. Redness, warmth, swelling, and pain, which is because of the pressure that's being put, because there's so much stuff loaded up in this one little area of your body. There's a quick inflammation picture. Blood flow is coming through, increased blood flow. So there's redness, red because of the blood, obviously, and heat because there's an increase in cellular activity, increase in metabolism. And what this usually has to do with, in case of a fever, is your body is trying to get rid of stuff. So things like white blood cells, WBCs, white blood cells, are getting sent to this area to get rid of something. Other things associated with inflammation, swelling and pain. Here's a condition called edema that I'm not going to ask you about. But just know what's going on here. It's changing like osmotic pressure, which is talking about water, fluid, water, which is... You know, usually full of something besides just pure water, like proteins and other things. And also pain. So there's pressure on nerve endings. When there's swelling, there's pressure on the nerve endings that's experienced by you as pain. For shallow wounds, and we're talking about just scraping the surface of the, of the epidermis. If just the epidermis is scraped, then the epithelial cells simply divide and fill in the space that is left over by the epidermis being scraped off. Versus a deep wound, which would be underneath, we'll see the layers in just a minute, 
epidermis, which is the second layer, or subcutaneous, which is the third layer, in deep to the surface. Blood vessels can be broken. Blood clots form and turn into a scab, form a scab. Um, and also phagocytes are going to go around and remove foreign particles because if you possibly skin your knee or worse, you're probably going to have chunks of something or pieces of something or maybe bacteria getting into your body, which is not a good thing. So, here are the layers of the skin. You will see cross-section after cross-section. If you haven't already, you're going to see more of them. I promise you'll have to know these for the test. There are four pictures in your book, 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, skipping 6.4, because it has to do with the nail, and going to 6.5. Here are the three layers. Epidermis is the top layer, and it's pretty thin compared to the dermis and the subcutaneous layers. And they are in that order. Epidermis, we've already seen this tissue, is stratified squamous. These are new cells coming up from the basement membrane, being pushed up, pushed up, pushed up, pushed up, about every two weeks. The guys at the top are already hardened. This is a process called keratinization where the cytoplasm of these cells fills up with a protein, keratin, this is misspelled, Oops. fill up with keratin and basically solidify. So they're pretty much dead. They're dead cells that form a waterproof layer on the outside, very, very outside of your skin. Here are the epidermal layers, including stratum lucinum, which is only found in thick skin. As far as these layers go, I only really care that you know about these. Stratum corneum, which is at the top. Stratum basale, which is at the bottom, which we'll see has an important function in a little bit. And stratum lucidum, which is only present in thick skin. So, here are the layers of just regular skin. Thick skin meaning like palms of your hands, soles of your feet, somewhere where you need a little bit extra layers for protection. All right? here are the layers of the epidermis, not including lucidum for thick skin. So this is just a regular old layer of skin found somewhere on your arm, leg, back, face, whatever. Here's where the stratum basale comes into place. It contains melanocytes, which are very important because they produce melanin, which is very important because it produces your skin pigment, which is very important because it stops UV radiation from penetrating too deep into your tissues and possibly damaging vital organs by like messing up the DNA, causing mutations, and possibly creating cancerous cells, which is obviously a bad thing. Skin color works like this. Everyone has the same number of cells that produce melanin. It is just the amount of melanin that is being produced. So you can see here in these pictures, light skin, not a whole lot of the pigment being produced. Dark skin, a lot more of the pigment being produced. Other factors that are included for making skin color, our blood supply, which would lead to a reddish color, beta carotene, found in carrots, which would lead to an orangey color, and bilirubin, which is just a protein that would lead to a yellowish color. Here is a skin condition called psoriasis that is um, basically an excess of keratinocytes which are going to be then be followed by inflammation because the immune system is mistaking uh, these cells for something that doesn't belong, so it tries to fend itself, defend itself from itself, which is kind of odd, but that's what happens. It's an overproduction of keratinocytes and inflammation, which causes psoriasis. Uh, another slide that you should have that I somehow got rid of is albinism. This is a total lack of melanin, melanocytes. The pigment is not being made, and so people with this genetic disorder do not have skin pigment. They are, of course, susceptible to things like sunburn, UV radiation. So, just a quick quiz. You can already see the answers because you already know them. Pigment-producing cell is called a melanocyte. Process of hardening epidermal cells is called keratinization. Reproductive layer of the epidermis, the bottom layer, basement layer, stratum basale. Epidermal pigment is called melanin. You'll see this in skin and later on in hair. Top layer of the epidermis is called the stratum corneum, top layer.
Moving further in from the surface is the dermis, so directly below the epidermis. There are a couple different things that are important here. One are these guys, dermal papillae, which actually produce your fingerprints. They're just made of dense connective tissue. You can see they have like these ridgy grooves to them, so they are pretty groovy tissue. And obviously grooves in your skin equals fingerprints. Uh, some other things here that are going to be very important, and you'll have to recognize many of these in the test, not just the ones that are circled. Here, sebaceous glands we'll talk about. You'll see those are making oil. The three layers of the skin, epidermis, dermis, and subcutaneous, also known as hypodermis. Fat, which is just these little blobs down here, colored yellow. Capillaries, sweat glands we'll talk about. Muscle, very specific muscle that's making goosebumps. You see that too. Bed sores. Very, very simple. A bed sore is the result of pressure on the skin blocking the skin's blood supply. If there's no blood supply, there's no oxygen and nutrients, the tissue starts to die. And that is obviously bad news because dead tissue is open to the environment, which is susceptible to infection. So people that are uh, in surgery, in coma, surgery for a long time, laying in a bed for a long time, in a coma, severely obese. Uh, people, these people have to be moved so that they don't produce bed sores. Subcutaneous layer, also known as the hypodermis, is made of loose connective tissue and adipose tissue. It is the insulation layer. So remember, when the body is regulating its temperature, it's producing heat from the muscles to stay warm, shivering, that shivering heat is going to be kept in by the subcutaneous or hypodermis, the bottom layer of the skin. And also, as you can see, a major blood supply. These blue and red tubes are capillaries, or veins and capillaries in that order. Um, briefly, very briefly, talking about severity of burns. It's very simple. There are three layers of the skin. There are three major degrees of burns, and they all have to do with these layers. So superficial first degree burn would be burning the epidermis. Second degree burn would be it would involve the dermis, and third degree burn would involve the subcutaneous layer and a lot of damage because that's quite a, that's pretty deep. I'm not going to ask you really to memorize all of them. Just know the simple part of it. It's just the layer of skin and its associated degree. First layer, second layer, and the third layer. We are going to stop here. So this is not taking up the rest of your night. Thank you for flying.